Another week, another episode of Shogun. This episode was a bit of a slow one with a much heavier focus on character interaction and emotional developments. The episode starts off with Omi receiving word that Yabu is arriving with Toronaga. As the man carrying the message runs towards Omi's premises, we cut to a working man eavesdropping, looking somewhat worried. Perhaps this could be the spy that Yabu told Omi about in a previous episode. There is a village character in the book but they were already introduced at this point in the story so I'm not sure if that arc will be included in the show. To be honest a lot of that character story arc doesn't really go anywhere with a huge part of it getting absolutely no payoff or even slight resolution. So in terms of things to cut out, the character story arc with the villagers was an obvious choice. I'm glad they're emphasising Toronaga's preference to keep people on a need to know basis. Multiple times Yabu has been caught off guard because he didn't know what Toronaga was doing until during or after. There was another great display of Toronaga's elite cunning and scheming capabilities. Yabu's welcoming party was also pretty cool. While we get some description of Anjuro in the book, it's always more satisfying to see something tangible instead of visualising it while reading. I'm glad we got to see such a large welcoming party and show of force for Yabu. We've seen him constantly humbled by greater men in the show so it was nice to get a reminder that he has some power and influence too. The old woman with Omi who's constantly complaining about bringing cheaper sake is actually his mother. In the book she's an intelligent but bitter woman who constantly criticises Omi's wife. She's pretty much the stereotypical nasty mother-in-law. I'm not gonna lie man, in the book I hated her character. She reminded me of Tony's mom in The Sopranos. Truly an annoying character. She's meant to be that way but it doesn't make it any less jarring. Also that one-eyed samurai had the voice of a god, holy shit. It was so funny because immediately after, another guy started the Yabushige chant and sounded like he was 16. They should have got the one-eyed samurai to do it in my opinion. Toronaga gives a cool speech and quickly leaves for Edo where he is safest. The important thing about this speech is that it was so rousing that the troops start to chant his name. This is genius from Toronaga since he was in potentially hostile territory with an ally who he knows is debating on betraying him. Rousing the troops makes it much more difficult for Yabu to organise a capture of Toronaga on the spot since they were all just chanting in favour of him. Next we have Blackthorn trying to find his men with little luck and then trying to get on his ship and get his guns but is quickly denied entry. He is told that since everything is now considered Toronaga's property, he doesn't have access to it. I know I say this every episode but man the sets look so good, the production in case you were wondering is still a 10 out of 10. We move on to Blackthorn being taken to his house. Since he was made a Hatamoto at the end of the last episode, he has been given some privileges worthy of that title. Here's where things get a bit weird. We skip quite a big scene in the book at this point. Yobu explains to Blackthorn that he is an honoured guest of both his and Toronaga's. As he is doing so he barks some orders at the villagers and they all look somewhat nervous and all take a look at Blackthorn. Blackthorn asks Mariko what was said and she explains that the main priority of him being at the village is to learn to speak Japanese. She also tells him that he states that if Blackthorn doesn't learn it satisfactorily within 6 months, every man, woman and child will be crucified in the village and the entire village will be burnt down. If you're enjoying this video, like and subscribe for more. I post a video a week and will be doing these Shogun videos every week as well. It's quite the big thing to leave out and I'm honestly starting to get a little worried. The show is moving at an incredibly fast pace and while I don't mind it usually, it does make certain things like the romance between Mariko and Blackthorn somewhat boring and sudden. I can't help but think that if I was a TV only watcher, I wouldn't care about the romance stuff and only really like the samurai related stuff in the show. It's quite unfortunate since the romance is such a big part of the book and actually makes the later part of the book quite interesting and significant. I can't really explain any more without going into spoilers. There is also quite a significant seppuku scene that was cut, I suspect they'll include it later. Similar to the dancing scene I referred to last episode, there's certain stuff that I think they'll just include and just mess with the timeline because they're such iconic scenes. If not though, I have a list of all the stuff that was cut out that I suspect will be included so if it isn't I'll just go over in the finale video. Back to Blackthorn. So he's given Hatamoto status. A Hatamoto was a special personal retainer of a daimyo who had the right of access to his lord and could wear swords in the presence of his lord. Page 118. In the book it is explicitly explained that a samurai cannot wear their swords in front of their lord unless they are a Hatamoto. During a meeting they would be expected to leave their swords outside. Since Blackthorn is Hatamoto he still can't wear his swords or pistols in the presence of Yabu, a different daimyo. This is why Omi asks Blackthorn for his pistol. I'll speak more on this scene later. The show hasn't really explained or focused on this as much so that scene just seems like Omi's being a bit of a dick to spite Blackthorn. We did have a scene where Yabu was told to hand his swords over before meeting Toronaga in episode 3. 
but that's the only instance that I recall. Let me know of any other scenes in the show where samurai had to unarm themselves when in the presence of a lord. Am I missing any? Blackthorn is given a house, a console and stuff. Here we get to see Fujiko, his consort, be introduced to her. She was vehemently against this and Blackthorn is also not a fan of the situation. It's quite ironic how both of them are essentially forced into this predicament due to duty. In the book's version, pretty much the same thing happens, but Blackthorn also gets to meet and interact with the entirety of his house staff. They sometimes change up the timeline of events in the show, with things happening sooner or later, or sometimes in different locations. An example of this is the meeting with Uwekiya or Uejiro in the show. Blackthorn meets him with Mariko but in the book he meets him alone. Outside of that the scene plays out the exact same with Blackthorn not understanding why the gardener isn't showing the same politeness as everyone else. Moving on to the real meat and potatoes of the episode. We get a scene with Yabu and Omi discussing the situation they're in and how they can come out with the most beneficial outcome. Omi yet again proves why he's the smartest of the Kashigi by reminding Yabu that right now all of the guns, the ship and the powder are under his control since Toronaga just left. He also explains how Yabu can use that as a bargaining ship if Toronaga is killed and gift these assets to Ishido. During that same night we get Blackthorn pondering about a situation and we finally get that scene with Mariko that has been spammed in literally every single one of the trailers for the show. You know the one, do not be fooled by our politeness. Next we have the scene that I've been waiting for since the series was announced and it's already one of my favourite scenes in the show. The Ie scene. So for context, this scene in the book was much more drawn out and intense. Blackthorn in both versions clearly has a deep seated aversion to Omi and Yabu to a lesser degree in the show. While Omi is being a bit of a dick in the way that he went about it showing up with 20 samurai in the book and the show, he is technically right since he can't bear arms in the presence of a lord. While in other circumstances Blackthorn may have listened, since it was Omi he was a bit more emotionally charged. This all culminated in a moment while he was waiting for Mariko to translate and his temper took over. Blackthorn's chest was constricted. He knew he was going to be attacked and he was furious at his own stupidity but there comes a time when you can't take any more and you pull a gun or a knife and then blood is spilled through stupid pride most times stupid if i'm to die omi will die first by god that was the context of the scene in the book so when we finally get to see blackthorn rebel against omi a man who had humiliated him so early on in the story it was so satisfying and to do so in Japanese was just the cherry on top. Fujiko or Fuji as she's called in the show's involvement in this scene is pretty much one to one with the book. She's a little more nervous in the way she handles the gun since she's never held the gun before obviously and a bit more confident and stoic in the way that she handles the gun in the show but I don't really mind that change. The point of the scene was still there and outside of that everything was pretty much the exact same. One thing I'll say about the live action version is that the actress who plays Fuji, Moeka Hoshi, is doing amazing. She has a very subtle sad sadness on her face at all times but I can't help but feel bad for the character. The book version was a little different since well first she was described as very ugly and also her melancholic look often annoyed Blackthorn in the book. It was harder to feel sympathetic towards her at the beginning. However as the book went on both Blackthorn and the reader became more understanding of her plight. Next we have Blackthorn demonstrating his knowledge and capabilities with his cannon. He's slowly been showing how he could be useful to Toronaga and Mariko but this is where he cements his position as a beneficial ally. Yabu and the other samurai are very pessimistic about the whole training situation but once he gets going they all realise his value. The accuracy and range of these cannon are like nothing the Japanese have seen. We then get a montage of trading and this is where Mariko starts to become a bit more fond of Blackthorn both in the book and the show. It's clear that seeing Blackthorn's competence increases her respect for it. Going from a rash barbarian to an accomplished adventurer and now Hatamoto in her eyes. During the montage they also show Blackthorn trying to learn a bit of Japanese and slowly improving, knowing words here and there while laughing with Mariko on horseback. After a few deep conversations about life, London and probably many more over the montage that we didn't see, this all culminates in them sleeping together. This scene was pretty similar in the book with Mariko pretending it was the maid and not her. The only difference is that in the book they spoke in Latin, a thing they did to speak without the risk of eavesdroppers since there were many spies and could be potential Christian samurai that understood Portuguese in secret. Because of that, many times they did speak romantically, they generally did so in Latin instead of Portuguese. There is one part of the romance that has me a bit worried. Anna Sawai seems to be playing quite a tempered version of Mariko, always having a cold and distant expression. This ends up manifesting as a lack of chemistry between Mariko and Blackthorn. Fujiko actually has much more chemistry with him, which is funny since the book version of Blackthorn actually quite disliked Fujiko at first. I hope Anna Sawai softens up her portrayal of Mariko a bit and shows a bit more emotion in the following episodes. Her performance in the serious scenes are great, but in the more fun and silly scenes, she's far too serious in my opinion. 
Now lastly we have that scene with Josen. Before I even get into the story, man, that final scene was directed so well in conjunction with the special effects. They really emphasise the brutality of that scene and if it seemed a little familiar, it's because the episode was directed by Fred Toy, who's previously directed two episodes of The Boys and an upcoming one in 2024. Watch The Boys if you haven't already, it's an excellent show. Anyways, back to the slaughter. In the book, the scenes of Josen played out quite differently, although the result was technically the same. The summoning of Yabu from the council and the entire conversation was pretty much the same in both versions. This is when things begin to differ though. In the book, Josen has many conversations that night, one of which reveals that Buntaro had escaped. While talking about the alleged Ronin that helped Toronaga escape Osaka, Josen reveals that hundreds of Ronin have been put to death. He is asked about Buntaro and accidentally lets it slip that they haven't found him yet. Remember those bandits, the ones that attacked you by land and sea? Of course. We took 450 heads that night. Many were wearing Toronaga's uniforms. Some were even wearing our greys. Not one escaped. They all died. And Buntaro-san? No, he. Josen stopped. The no had slipped out, but now that he had said it, he did not mind. No, we did not know for certain. No one's collected his head. Also in the OG version, Yabu isn't caught completely off guard by Naga's actions. Yabu needs a way to get Josen out of the picture without incriminating himself. Since the Council of Regents is pressuring Yabu to 1. Betray Toronaga and 2. Summon him to Osaka where they'll most likely force him to commit seppuku, this is where Omi pitches the idea to Yabu to get Naga to kill Josen for them by baiting him since he's a kid and brash and eager for battle. Now onto the actual killing of Josen. I genuinely enjoyed the show's version of events. It was so dark and interesting since the focus of the show was on cannon while the original was on muskets. This is a change like many in the show that actually makes the events more historically accurate because the Japanese were already familiar with muskets since the Portuguese had already introduced them. I gotta give props to the show man. If I'm gonna criticise bad changes like the Buntero scene, I have to give props to changes that actually improve on the source material, like this one. Anyway, in the book, Josen actually gets to inspect the musket regiment and right before the final demonstration, Naga decides to kill him. Yabu calls out for the samurai to get information but only half listen to it. The other half stays still with Naga with their barrels locked onto Josen and his samurai. This part is the same with Naga exclaiming his anger and offence at the insults Josen has thrown his way. Believe it or not, the slaughter is actually more brutal in the book. Not necessarily the way it happens, more so how the characters were so nonchalant about it and even somewhat sinister. Naga and his samurai toy with Josen. Josen pleads for his life using every bit of logic in his being. Naga tells him he must die since he's seen the demonstration and they can't risk Ishido finding out. Josen says Ishido already knows since he sent out a messenger and a carrier pigeon the night before. Now you've seen the attack, I cannot risk Ishido learning all this. He already knows. Josen blurted out, blessing his foresight of the previous evening. He knows already. I sent a message by a pigeon secretly at dawn. You gain nothing by killing me, Naga-san. Naga motioned to one of his men, an old samurai, who came forward and then threw the strangled pigeon at Josen's feet. Then a man's severed head was also cast upon the ground. The head of the samurai, Masumoto, sent yesterday by Josen with the scroll. The eyes were still open, the lips drawn back in a hate-filled grimace. The head began to roll. It tumbled through the ranks until it came to rest against the rock. Josen let out a defeated sigh and Naga and his samurai laughed. The slaughter continued and Omi smiled as he reflected on how easy it was to manipulate Naga. Omi and Naga stayed as witnesses so they could sign the death certificates and write the report of the events later. Blackthorn was also told to stay. Naga believed since they were his weapons, he also had responsibility for their deaths and therefore should witness them. The last we saw of Josen was him begging and pleading for help to Yabu as he rode off back to the village. Hiding his vast satisfaction, Yabu turned and left. Josen shrieked, Yabu-sama, please, Yabu-sama. Damn, that was dark, even on a reread. As always, let me know what you thought about the book's version of events and the changes and the similarities. If you enjoyed these videos, be sure to like and subscribe. I love making them since it gives me an excuse to reread parts of Shogun. While I love the book, let's be honest man, no one's rereading 1,200 pages. I also have a question for you guys this week. Are there any of you who have never read the book that decided to start reading the book once you started the show? I know this happened a lot with Game of Thrones, so I'm just curious if any of you have become book readers since the week long waits between episodes are torturous. Even for someone who knows what's gonna happen. The show is moving up quite the fast pace with episode 4 ending at page 563 in the book. But honestly this is kind of the pace that's required since it's a 1200 page book. They have roughly 700 pages left 
and six episodes left. At a pace of around 100 to 125 pages per episode, it is doable. And I am still very much so enjoying the show. I'll be honest, I'm, I don't need it to be one-to-one -one with the book. While I do lament the stuff that's cut for time, being a book reader adds so much context and depth to the show for me already, so I don't get caught up in deviation. I just hope they hit all the main story beats. There are quite a few iconic moments, and I can understand cutting the scruff and, 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 and maybe some of the development scenes for certain stuff that isn't that significant, but you have to hit these main, iconic, very significant story beats. Anyway, so far I'm loving the show and I'll definitely recommend it to anyone. In terms of a rating right now, I'll probably give it like an 8 or a 9, I'm not sure. I kind of find a weird rating shows before they finish since the conclusions are so important. I can't wait for next week's episode. And yeah, till next time.